welcome to worship. Um, I'm afraid we're down to our third string choir director this morning. Um, the starter and the backup uh, entered the COVID protocol and one of them opted out. I just hope neither of them plan to enter the transfer portal. Um, but nonetheless, you're stuck with me this morning. Uh, our first hymn uh, is, Oh God, Our Help in Ages Past. So if you will stand and we will sing together. pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, for the gift of this day we give thanks. And Father, in this day, as we begin a new year, Father, we know that you are still the same God. Your love still endures. Father, your love and grace and mercy are new each and every day. Father, you never change. And we come here today to this place just to worship you. And so, Father, as we do that, Father, would you take your time, take this time and make it yours. Father, help us to grow to become more like Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. As Philip's already done, welcome to worship. It's so good to see you in God's house today. We've gotten off to a good start. We had our breakfast fellowship this morning. Uh, great food, great conversations around tables, and, and it was just a great time. And now we get to come here and worship. What a great day uh, that we've already begun here in this place today. If you're visiting with us today, I want to thank you for choosing First Baptist as your place of worship. We are so happy to have you with us and joining us uh, today in this worship service. And we ask that you do a little favor in just a few moments. When the pew pad is passed, if you could just fill out some information about yourself, that'll help us get to know you better. And so, once again, welcome to worship. If you look on the inside of your order of worship today, on the right-hand side of that page, there is a listing uh, as we begin uh, a new year. Uh, by the way, Happy New Year. I didn't say that get going, so Happy New Year. Uh, but there's also a listing of all of our Bible studies as they are beginning uh, during the month of January. And so uh, some of these are brand new studies. Some of them are a continuation because we got started late in the fall. Uh, but there's a total listing of all the activities that are going on that are restarting during the month of January. Uh, a couple of things that I want to highlight. Uh, first of all, next week during our worship service, it'll be a special day in the life of our church as we'll have our ordination for our new deacons as well as installation 
uh, for those uh, the older deacons and also the installation of the officers. And so you want to make sure that you join us next Sunday for that special service. Also next Sunday night, uh, David Hull will be leading a, 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 I don't know what you'd call that, class, uh, something, sermon, something, Sunday night, uh, January the 9th here at 6 p.m. And the title of that is Getting to Know Our Larger Baptist Family. What we'll be focusing on in, in that discussion will be, um, you know, who exactly is the Southern Baptist Convention and the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship? And what do these mean to us as a church? And this is particularly important to us as we continue in our pastor search that we have these questions answered. I know that I'm going to be attending because I've even got questions about it. But this is a good time to get those questions answered. And so we encourage you to join us uh, next Sunday night at 6 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. As you notice, and Philip has already alluded to, uh, Adair is not with us today. Uh, on yesterday, Adair uh, tested positive for COVID. Uh, she and Alex are both at home uh, quarantining, and uh, so we want to be in prayer for, for them this week. Um, but it's also a good time for us, a good reminder for us, that I want to remind you that we need to take care of ourselves and we also need to take care of each other. At all of our doors um, are masks, there are, there's hand sanitizer, there's, there's all sorts of, of things that we can do to help take care of ourselves and each other. And so I wanna encourage you to do that. As this time where we are increasing, we're seeing spikes in our COVID numbers, but also the flu is going around now as well. And so we wanna be aware of those things and we wanna take precautions against those. And so I just wanna remind you of those things and please be in prayer for Adair and Alex in the days ahead. Lots of other things going on in the life of our church. These are listed in your order of worship and also your tie. And so take a moment and look at those at different opportunities that we have uh, coming up during the month of January. So glad to see you now, and as, as we continue our time of worship, would you also begin to pass the pew pads? Thank you.
Hey, I'm back. Uh, today's passage uh, is found in Exodus chapter 40, and today I'll be reading verses 1 through 5, as well as verses 34 through 38. Hear now from God's word. Then the Lord said to Moses, set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, on the first day of the first month. Place the ark of the testimony in it and shield the ark with the curtain. Bring in the table and set out what belongs on it. Then bring in the lampstand and set up its lamps. Place the gold altar of incense in front of the ark of the testimony and put the curtain at the entrance to the tabernacle. And from verse 34 through 38. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day and fire was in the cloud by night in sight of all the house of Israel during all their travels. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I did say third string choir director, right? <laughs> All right, let's stand for our next hymn, please. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings that you have given to us each and every day. As we gather here today, let us give with cheerful and grateful hearts in return to you. Bless these tithes and offerings so that they may be used to spread your word and love to those all around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
continuing our theme of backups and replacements this morning. Here I am again. Now some of you, some of you are thinking this is the last time I come to church the weeks after Christmas, I tell you. Um, David will be back next week, I promise. We'll, we're, we're okay. Um, as, as has already been mentioned as we pray this morning, we remember a dare um, who is home, who has tested positive for COVID. We remember, we'll remember her and Alec. Would you pray with me as we continue in worship this morning? Father, how good it is to be able to gather in your house this day. Lord, here in the early stages of a new year, to be able to come and to spend this time in your house to root our year in the worship and praise and glory of you. And so, God, we pray in this time that you might be glorified, that our hearts might be open to your word, that we might hear from you this day, that we might set a course for the year that will keep us focused on you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Tommy already read from us for read to us from Exodus 40. I'll pick up and just reiterate the last few verses, um, picking up in verse 36. And it's interesting, these are the final words of Exodus. I don't know if you caught that, but this is the very end of the book of Exodus. The last words that are written in that book, verse 36 says, "...in all the travels of the Israelites..." Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. And so the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle day by day, and fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the house of Israel during all of their travels. May God add rich blessings to the reading and hearing of His Word this day. Uh, Show of hands, how many of us made it till midnight on Friday? Okay, look at y'all. Good job. We actually made it this year. It was a rare, and we didn't have kids, which is a rare, if I don't have children and stay up till midnight, that is quite a, because usually it's the excitement of, the excitement of knowing I can go to bed and sleep as late as I want makes me want to get to it as quickly as possible. But, but we made it. You know, you know why we stay up till midnight, right? You know where it all started. Got to make sure the world doesn't end. That's, yeah, we're laughing a little bit, but that is, the tradition is, the tradition began, and I promise y'all this isn't another end of the world sermon. I know I did that to y'all once already, but that is the tradition. People, you stay up to the end of the year because, you know, the, the year is ending. Make sure everything goes as it's supposed to be. Um, and obviously, different years, that's on more people's minds than usual. I doubt any of us were all that worried about what was going to happen when the clock struck midnight on Saturday morning. But bless her heart, my grandmother rang in the year 2000. Y'all remember the year 2000. She rang in the year 2000, huddled in her bathroom with the bathtub full of water so that when the grid went down, she would have drinking water that she could barter and sell and whatever happened in the new world that was created. She was ready to go. It's interesting, this is just an aside, like I said, we're, we're going to move on from the end of the world here in a minute. It's always interesting to me that we assume the world's going to end at Eastern Standard Time. Have you ever thought about that? We just, we just take for granted if the world's going to end, it's going to end at the New York market. Like, why, where else would it do? There, a couple of years ago, um, I... It may have been one of the 2012 end of the worlds. I'm I'm not sure. Um, But the guy factored, um, he factored time zones into it. So he had this, oh yeah, you'll see, 18 hours earlier or whatever it is, the world will end in New Zealand. And then it'll just, you'll get to watch it coming the entire time. Um, Didn't work out that way, obviously, but I appreciate that attention to detail. So that tradition, that idea of staying up to watch and make sure that the new year comes has found its way into different traditions and their faith practices. If you grew up in the Methodist church, if you, if you have any connection to Methodist church, you might be familiar with a watch night service, which has its roots in that new year 
mentality. It's a New Year's Eve service where you stay up and watch the night to make sure the New Year does indeed come. A lot of African American churches still do a watch night service and do a big deal with it. It's, an, it's a very big, it is as big in some cases as the Christmas Eve service. And they bring in bands and celebrate the New Year coming. And it, it is an interesting, um, some friends of mine were, were walking us through what their service looks like at a class I had to do for Gardner Webb. And they talked about, you know, the, the beginning of it is very mournful because the year is ending and then the clock hits midnight and the celebration starts and they bring in the new year. So they don't just look forward. They take these words of Exodus, that beginning, that first verse of Exodus. I don't know if you caught it, but the Lord says to Moses, set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting on the first day of the first month. What's being described to us in Exodus 40 is a new year's service. It is, the, it is the new year, and they are told to begin the year setting up the tent, setting up the tabernacle, getting it ready for the presence of God. And so they take this, they take this as their guide, and they use it as an opportunity to reflect, you know, to look back on the year that was as they wait and get ready for the year that's coming, which you know, has found its way into everything we do for the new year, right? New Year's is a time to look back, assess those resolutions if you made them, figure out how they worked out, whether everything came through. I didn't do resolutions this year. I'll tell you why. I've stopped doing resolutions. So I made a resolution in 2020. I had a resolution for 2020. I was going to embrace Shelby, North Carolina. I lived in Shelby for seven years at that point. I moved to Shelby in 2013. That's where Megan and I had lived our entire marriage. That's where I worked. That's where Davis was born. And at that point, Abigail was on the way. But it always felt like a stopover to me. You know, it was always this place I lived because, you know, that's where I went to school and I just ended up living there. It never felt like home. So I was going to embrace Shelby. That was my goal for 2020. I was going to get more involved in the community. I was going to go to more local events. I was going to really become a member of Shelby, North Carolina, become a resident, really embrace it, Shelby, North Carolina. That was January of 2020. I made that resolution. Two months later, we were inside our house for six months. Um, and then that October, I moved. So all in all, my, my decision to embrace Shelby that year didn't work out, so not the best follow-up on that one. But looking back is important, and focusing on what's next is important. And there is this one thing that we've heard in these words from Exodus that reveal to us what we should always be assessing, that reveal to us how we should always be analyzing what we're doing and where we're going. And that is the question of who is guiding our steps. So back to these words, we've heard them twice now already in verse 36. We get this picture of how the Hebrew people moved in the wilderness and what led to their moving and how they traveled and how they picked where they went. And it's a very clear pi picture. It's a real simple picture. They did not move unless God directed it. Whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. If God was resting in the tabernacle, they didn't move. If God began to leave, when God showed them it was time to go, they went. When God rested, they rested. When God lingered, they lingered. When God moved, they moved. And when God stopped, they stopped. They didn't say... You know, God, I'm looking ahead. There's a much better location a couple miles up. We're just going, we're just going to keep going for a little bit and we'll get to that and settle down. They didn't say, ah, you, you walked us right past the water there. You think we can, think we can circle around for a minute and go back? Now, where God moved, they moved. And where God stopped, they stopped. God guided every step that they did or didn't take. 
So what I hope we can do this morning is take a minute to look back on 2021. Take a minute to look back on the year we've had, and I wonder as we assess that year, what guided your steps? Where was your focus in the last year? What was the thing or the person or whatever it was that motivated your actions? You know, maybe as we look back over the last year, we realize we were motivated an awful lot by fear. You know, we faced another strange year. It was another year of uncertainty all over, you know, global uncertainty with the pandemic still going on, the political uncertainty of new president and all that comes with that. Of course, we have the uncertainty here in the church of this transition season and everything that comes along. How much did that impact you over the last year? If you're really willing to take a look. We see that in the Hebrews time in the desert, if you keep reading, if you go into numbers and the rest of the story, when fear overcomes their trust, they start moving or not moving on their own and it backfires on them. You know, when God tells them it's time to go into the Holy Land, they say, eh, not so fast. Did you see who's living in there? Maybe we need to think that through. And it backfires and none of them are allowed into the Holy Land. Did you let uncertainty cloud your faith this year? Did you pause on something that God was calling you to move on? Did you keep moving because you were afraid of what might happen if you took if you let momentum die and you took the rest that you knew God was calling you towards, but you had to keep going. You couldn't stop. You couldn't stop. This was the moment. This was the time. Were you too impatient to let something play out because of the chance it might not go the way you wanted if you didn't jump on the moment when it first came? Did you close ranks this year? Was this a year of tightening your circle for fear of what would come if you followed a call to reach out, to branch out, to speak to someone who you were being called towards. You know, fear can be a powerful guide. Fear can drive all kinds of things. Where did it play a part in your year? Where did it, where did it linger in 2021? And are you going to let it drive this next year too? Maybe if we're looking at 2021, we realize that anger dr drove our steps a little more than we'd like to admit. Moses lets anger direct him at some point, doesn't he? You go to Numbers 20, the Hebrew people are, are clamoring, they want water, they want water, and Moses finally gets fed up and he slams his staff into a rock, and sure enough, water comes out, but he's punished because it wasn't what God what I had told him to do. It was a frustrating year in a lot of ways, wasn't it? All those things that could make us fearful could also make us frustrated and angry. Maybe the frustration motivated us a little more than we'd like to admit. Maybe we were driven by those frustrations more than we realized. Maybe you look back at 2021 and see conversations and text messages and interactions you'd like to have back. You see decisions that you wish you had waited to cool down before you made. Maybe when you look over the last year, it's defined by the people you pushed away and the relationships that got strained almost to a breaking point. Just an aside on that, you'll find that people are a whole lot more forgiving than you expect them to be. If there are folks you pushed away in this last year, you'll find that they are most likely much more receptive of an apology than you want to admit or that you'd expect. Just because anger served as more of a guide for us than we'd like in this last year doesn't mean we have to let it be the case this year. So many things might have guided our steps in 2021. Maybe our financial interests or our social lives or our politics or any number of things. It all amounts to the same issue, we're the ones doing the guiding. We're not waiting on the cloud to move to direct us. We're not watching where God is leading. We're taking 
the reins. We're taking control and we're deciding where the steps come. And that's difficult because we're really good at convincing ourselves that God's steps and our steps are the same, right? We're really good at, realize, at convincing ourselves that what I want and what God wants have to be in line. Why wouldn't God want the same thing that I do? You might remember um, last summer I preached on 2 Samuel 6. You know, remember 2 Samuel 6? Maybe it didn't make the impact on you that it has on me. Um, David is moving the ark to Jerusalem. Do you remember this story? David is going to get the ark. And I preached on it for two reasons. One, there were a lot of weird names in it. And if you remember, my theme for the summer was to make Tommy read names that he would struggle with. That's how I kept going in this season of uncertainty. But, but two, it's such a perfect example of how we convince ourselves that God's plan and ours are perfectly lined up. The, if you remember it, if I can refresh your memory, David goes to get the ark and he brings together all the fighting men of Israel. David brought together all of, out of all of Israel chosen men, 30,000 of them. And he sets them up and they go to get the ark and he brings all these people, makes them leave their home to be part of this procession. And he ignores all the guides in Scripture that say how the ark is supposed to be moved. And he puts the ark on a cart because everyone will be able to see it and it'll move quicker and it'll go. And he gets people bring horns and drums and David's at the front of the parade on his horse. And it is this triumphant moment where David is bringing the ark back to Jerusalem because God is being glorified and David's being glorified. And of course God would want David's glory in this moment. And if you remember the story, the ark, the cart that the ark is on goes off the road because they're moving too fast. And it tips over and someone reaches out to try and keep the ark from hitting the ground. But if you remember Raiders of the Lost Ark, you can't touch the ark of the covenant. Um, and the person dies and the ark ends up in a shed and it takes three months before David goes back. It all falls apart because David assumed that God would want him to move the ark in a way that made David look good. David assumed that what would bring him glory would bring God glory too. That the steps he wanted to take were the steps that God was directing. It's a dangerous thing when we get convinced that our plan and God's plan overlaps perfectly. We start letting a whole host of things guide our steps while we trick ourselves into believing that God's at the will. So how are we going to change that this year? What are we going to do about these things? How do we give God more control over the year? And it is, ironically, I think, in the part of Exodus 40 that I had Tommy skip over when he was reading. If you go back, you know, we, we missed a whole chunk of that chapter, and there are two reasons for it. One, because it's time-consuming, and two, because if you read it, it's, it's not the most interesting thing. It is the instructions for how the, how the tent, how the, or how the tabernacle was set up. But if you've got some time this afternoon, go back and read it. Get all the details. It's repetitive. It's difficult to read. You know, God says, do this, and Moses went and did that. It's a lot of that over and over. But here's what it shows if you go back and read it, if you go back and take the time. When they were doing things right, it wasn't just when they moved that God directed. They didn't just let God guide when they moved and when they stopped and all that kind of thing. God determined what direction the tent faced. God determined what different aspects of it were made out of. God determined who was allowed in at different times. It wasn't just the big decisions that they waited for God. They turned every decision over to God so that when it came time for a big one, they knew what voice they were listening for. When it came time, they didn't have to worry about whether they were hearing the right thing or not because they knew who it was that was guiding them. They had turned all those decisions over 
and it let them know that they were on the right track. One element of watch night services in the Methodist tradition or in the African American church, one thing to bring it full circle this morning, is a call to reaffirm the covenant of baptism. Yeah, in, in the Methodist church, it's a whole process. The book of order has a guide to it. But I'd invite you this morning, those of you who have been baptized, think back to that moment. Think back to your baptism for a moment and the statement of faith you were called to make. Chances are it was something similar to what we do here. Some statement close to Jesus Christ is Lord. Have you ever thought about why we call for that statement? Why that's the thing we ask for? We don't make a statement in that moment about salvation, even though we know that this is an act symbolizing Jesus saving us. We don't say, Jesus Christ is my Savior, even though we don't know He is. We say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Because baptism is a decision for this life and the next. It's a decision in this moment to give up that control. It's a declaration that we are turning the wheel over. We're letting God take over. It is a sign and a symbol that we are letting someone else guide our steps. So what I want us to do today, and we don't do this a lot here, but I think y'all can handle it. I believe in you. I'd ask everybody to take a second, close your eyes, bow your head for us. And I'd ask you to think about the last year. Really think about it for a second. And ask yourself, can I really say that Jesus Christ was Lord over 2021? Can I really say that I trusted God to guide my steps? Can I really say that I moved when God said move and I stopped when God said stop? And if you can't say those things, as you look back over the year, are you happy with the way it turned out? Can you honestly look back and say that things were better because in this last year you decided to run the show? And so what I want to challenge all of us to do right now, right where we are, whether it's for the first time or it's a repetition because repetition makes habit I want all of us to take a moment here in this place and declare that Jesus Christ is going to be Lord of 2022. You got one day to run things yourself. We gave you yesterday for free. It's January 2nd. Declare right now that for the next 364 days, Jesus Christ is Lord. Not your fear, not your anger, not your money, not your politics, not your social life, not your need to be right or prove that someone else is wrong. For this year and for this church and for all of us here, Jesus Christ is Lord. Make that covenant this morning. Set up the tabernacle and welcome the presence of God. Let God linger this day so that when God moves, you move. And when God leaves, When God moves, you move, and when God stays, you stay for this year. Jesus Christ is Lord. For all that we do, Jesus Christ is Lord. Can we say it this morning? Can we declare in this season that we are turning over the guide? That for us, for this year, Jesus Christ will be Lord. Father, it can be a scary thing to give up our control, to give up our grip. Lord, we're a people that likes to keep our hands on the wheel. And so, God, my prayer for us this morning is that we're willing to honestly take a look on how, at how that's worked out for us. God, that we're willing to honestly assess how we've been doing controlling things on our own. Lord, I pray that as we assess, as we we make that honest look this morning, we might realize that the mistake we made is not giving up our control to you. 
is not allowing you to be Lord. And so, God, I pray for all of us this morning that we might be willing to declare it right now in this place, that you are going to be Lord over the next year, that you are going to guide our steps, that when you move, we will move, and when you stop, we'll stop. God, may we be willing this day to give up that control, to let go of the reins just a little bit, to trust that if we follow where you lead, we'll see the good that comes of it. Be with us, God. Guide our steps this day. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. This morning we will give opportunity to respond. Perhaps just now in this moment you prayed for the first time for Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life and you would like to make public that decision that you have made to trust Jesus as Savior, to give up control of your life, to let Him guide your steps. We would celebrate with you and rejoice in that with you this morning. Perhaps you realized in this moment that you need a church family to help you keep try to keep that pledge on track, try to live out that declaration. We would welcome you here as we strive to do the same. If there is something, a declaration you need to make publicly, something you would like prayer for, I'll be down front. My prayer for all of us on this second day of the first month is that we hear the words of Exodus and spend some time setting up the tabernacle today. That we prepare the tent and welcome the presence of God. That whether it's here publicly or some, somewhere alone, we respond to where God is speaking today. Joy to worship with you. And keep, keep Adair and Alec in your prayers as they're recovering. So many others we know who have, who have gotten sick over this break. We remember folks who are traveling here in these next couple of days. As we go, we're going to do one more thing different on you. All right? We're going to have a little bit of an interactive benediction. Okay, so I'm going I'm to make a statement, and then y'all are going to respond with Jesus Christ as Lord. All right, so we're going we're gonna to start up here where you can see me so I can cue you, and then we're going to go from there. So, as we go from this place, Jesus Christ is Lord. may our steps be guided by the one who can guide us in the right path. Jesus Christ is Lord. May our prayer for this year be to take less control and trust in God more. Jesus Christ is Lord. In every step you take this year, May your pledge always be, Jesus Christ is Lord. Go in peace, the love, and serve the Lord. Amen.